Leo has given us this morning for a scripture reading, Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. We'll be reading that in just a moment. First of all, let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, we come, Father, for several reasons. To worship you, to thank you, Father, and to remember your Son, Christ, as he died for us, and what it means to us as Christians. And hopefully, Father, to learn something that we haven't learned before or are refreshed from the lessons that we learned, and that we can take these out into the world and become better Christians tomorrow than we were today. Be with us through this service, Father. Help us to understand that there is only one way. We thank you for showing us that path. Be with those, Father, who are uh, about to go undergo surgery. Be with those that attend to them and guide their hands, surely. Bring them back to us if it be your will as soon as possible. And be with those, Father, who are recuperating from other injuries and, and ailments. Be with those that surround them and their families. Strengthen them all, Father, with only the love that you can do. Be with us through our lives. Help us to be better Christians each day of our lives. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Philippians chapter 4, <coughs> verses 10 through 13. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now the that now at last you take care of both things. Your care of me has flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned to whatever state I am in, there to, there to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which is strengthening me. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to each and every one that is here this morning. Our, we have quite a few of our number that are traveling away, and I forgot to make mention of those in Bible class this morning, but we want to keep them in our prayers. As, as uh, I said, there's a great many of those. You know, as this weekend we celebrate the freedom of this great country of ours, you know, we, we do a, a lot of complaining about things in our country, but I tell you what, I don't know as any other place I want to live. How about you? Amen to that. But, you know, in our country, a lot of people have gotten to the point where they believe that their needs are their wants. And uh, so I thought I would uh, take a lesson from Philippians chapter 4 and talk about having what we need and not always what we want. You know, one of the truly valuable pieces of knowledge to possess in life is to know what it is that I really need, then to be able to separate that from my wants, and then therein to be content. You see, what we have to do is to learn the difference. It's just like with our children. You know, they have very few needs when they're born, right? Just uh, feed them, uh, have a, a dry diaper for them, uh, uh, give them some rest. That's pretty much uh, it until they reach about the age of two, right? Uh, then it's just, you know, something happens and, you know, uh, they want this and that. And then, and then 13 hits, right? You know, parents, you know, when 13, if you don't, you'll find out because, man, things change then. And then, and then comes 16. And 16, they begin to think that um, they have needs that are really their wants. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know the, the, the young people begin to think, well, I need a car, you know. Um, uh, there was a young uh, Christian boy, and he was telling his father that he needed to have a car. And he was uh, uh, just about to turn 16, and his father said, well, you know, he says, if you'll cut that long hair of yours, he says, I'll uh, help you buy that car in some way. Well, he was proud, proud of that hair of his, and, and he didn't want to cut it. So he went on, he'd ask his dad, that's the way, no, you got to cut that hair. And so one Sunday morning, uh, they went to uh, church and Bible class in church, and that after, uh, afterwards they were eating lunch, and, and the young man in their class that day had watched uh, a video on the times and life of Christ. And, and he made the comment to his father, he said, well, he says, Dad, he says, I, I need that car. And he says, and I saw a video this morning, he says, and, and uh, Jesus, he said, he had long hair. And his dad looked at him and said, yeah, and he walked everywhere he went. <laughs> so, so, so having needs uh, are not like one's wants. 
In Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, you remember Paul had established the church of Christ there at Philippi. They had been supporting Paul from the very time that he had established the congregation until the time that he writes them the letter. And he says in chapter 1, verse 5, he says, You have had fellowship with me in the furthest of the gospel from the first time until now. And he says here in verse 10, he says that you have been supporting me. He said there was a time when you uh, didn't because you lacked opportunity. And I take that to mean that there was probably a time when they didn't know exactly where Paul was. So they were not able to uh, financially support him. But he says that now you have revived your support for me. And Paul says this, says that he's not doing this to remind them of uh, that he has some wants, but rather to commend them for their generosity. Because what Paul does in our text this morning is he assures them that he has learned whatever state that he is in, therein to be content, of chapter 4 and verse 11. He says that there's been times when there's been plenty. That's where he says to abound. And he says there's been times when there's been very little. That's to be abased. But he says he has learned the secret of contentment within both situations. And I need to ask this morning, have we learned that same thing? You know, it's easy to be content when we have everything that we want, right? When everything's going well and uh, all those uh, relationships and uh, finances and everything is going right, the car is not broke down, uh, it's, it's easy to be content then. But what about when things are, are thin and little? That, that's the times when we also have to be content as well. But in this text, Paul says twice, I learned, I have learned. And so what we learned from that is that being content is a learning process. And we need to also admit that not all of us learn it as well, nor as fast as others, but still it is a learned asset that each of us as Christians should come to cherish. Now contentment is learned through a practice of the Word of God. It is where the we say the rubber meets the road. You know, you can tell a Christian, we can tell ourselves over and over again the value of returning good for evil. You know, that's just a, a basic thing that as Christians we should do. We have the example of Christ. Or being honest in all that you do. We can uh, tell one another that and we can tell ourselves that. Uh, we can tell about the value of treating others in the way we want to be treated, not in the way that they have treated us, you know. Uh, do uh, unto others as you would have them do unto you. And yet, until we put this into practice for ourselves, we will not learn the contentment that those things bring. You see, it's once we put the Word of God into practice and we lose that anxiety and that worry over things and understand that God will provide Jehovah Jireh, that God will give us all that we need and more than we could want or deserve if we look at it from His perspective, then we can have that contentment learned in our life. So we have to learn the difference in wants and needs. You know, we have to learn those differences even in converting the world. Think about it. You know, we want to convert everyone, right? But we have all friends and family and neighbors and people that we want to, them to hear the gospel of Christ, to obey it and to be saved or anything. And so I want all people to be converted, but that's my want. My need and my charge is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So even in that, we have to understand that if our contentment is tied to our wants, then I will never run the contentment that God has for me. Because he says that he'll supply my every need. And so when I learn to be content as with that which God says that he will supply, instead of trying to have my wants met, then is when we learn that true commitment that brings us to contentment. The Word of God teaches and illustrates to us over and over again about the need to learn to be content with our needs. And then, as Solomon says, whatever else comes in life, 
is to be enjoyed as the prosperity of our labors, that gift that God has given us. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, the verses 18 and 19. He says that a man that does not enjoy the prosperity of his labors is above all men miserable. He says that we are to enjoy that because God has given us that. And if we will spend our time thinking upon the good things that God has given and provided for us, then we will have very few times to think about whatever troubles and different things are going on out there in this world. You see, we can never find contentment in satisfying wants, especially in the way of monetary abundance. There in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 10, he says, the man that wants silver never has silver enough. He says, and the more that one amasses, the more people that you have. You ever notice the more money someone has, the more friends they have. And that's what Solomon says. He said, you got more miles to feed. He says, you get to a certain point where even with abundance of things, that all you can do is look at it. Right? And there is no joy nor contentment in that. You see, what the Bible teaches us is that when we come to the well of the world, to satisfy our thirst, the well is dry. Have you ever had a well go dry? It'll pump sand. But brethren, when we go to the well of the Lord, you with me this morning? When we go to the well of the Lord, we're always going to find satisfaction and contentment. Whenever you come to the well of the Lord, you don't go away thirsty. May not have everything you want, but you'll always, we'll always have that which we need. In 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah, he'd been down at the brook Kidron. And the Lord sent him down there and he'd been being fed by the ravens. And now he's told to leave there and go to Zarephath. And he says there's a widow there, I want you to look her up and she's going to take care of you. Well, Elijah gets to town and then he comes upon the widow and she's gathering up sticks. And he says to her, he says, man, could you bring me a drink of water? And she says, certainly. He says, and, and by the way, he says, when you bring me that water, could you, you bring me a, 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 basically a biscuit? He says, bring me back a morsel of bread. Could you bring me back a bread? She said, well, sir, she says, as a matter of fact, she says, I was gathering these sticks to, to make a fire. And she says, uh, I've got just enough meal in my jar and enough oil in my Cruise to, to make just one more meal of bread for me and my son. And she said, we're gonna, I was going to make that meal, and after that we were basically going to die because we have nothing else. And Elijah says to her, he says, listen, he says, you're going to make me that bread, and the Lord will not allow your meal jar to go empty, nor your cruise of oil to run out. And so she goes and she makes him bread. She comes back next meal and she opens a jar that only had a little bit in it, but it still got a little bit in it. It had enough for her to make that next meal, enough oil in there. She went away, same thing, come back again. Are you with me? She comes back and that, every time she went to that meal, it may not have been completely full, but there was enough in there for that meal that she needed to continue to survive. That's the way it is with God. Every time you go to the jar of meal and the container of oil, there's plenty to make bread for that day. That widow woman had everything she needed, not necessarily all that she wanted. But that's the key to contentment. It is knowing that God will supply our every need. Amen. We go to the well of the Lord and we can drink in abundance. We shall not go without. Those who serve the Lord will not go begging bread. He shall supply our every need. You know, we learn the lesson every day of making do with what we have. Don't we? Because we cannot get what we want. We want gas to be a dollar a gallon. <laughs> amen? I got an amen on that one. But, it, but, it's, but it's three dollars a gallon. So what do we do? Well, we use less. 
Right? We seek just to meet our needs because we cannot get what we want. You say, well, where's the contentment in that? Well, the contentment in that comes that we're thankful that, number one, we've got a car to put gas in. That we've got a, a, a job to, that allows us to buy, buy that $3 a gallon gas. You see, that's where the contentment comes in. God has blessed me. He's not brought the price of gasoline down, but he's blessed me. Abundantly. And so, I'm not anxious over those things. We're not to be worrisome over those things that God has said he will take care of. When we don't have what we want, we should learn to be content with what we have or we will make ourselves miserable. With God, that which we need will always be there as long as we are seeking that which is right. And that is the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Jesus said in Matthew 6 and verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all these things. Remember in the text, he's been talking about food and clothing and raiment and, and, and gas and a job and all of those things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all those things will be added unto you. What we have to do is to seek first the kingdom of God. You see, after searching for contentment and other things, we learn we hopefully learn that what is important is serving God, living a righteous life, overcoming temptation, helping our fellow man. And anything other than that, God will provide, as He promised us He would do, if we seek first the kingdom of God. Now, in the last few minutes I have, I want us to understand what does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? Because that's the key to contentment. That's the key to learning what it is we really need instead of seeking after the things that we want. Paul said that his ability to do all things and in the context, that was to find contentment, whether he had plenty or he had little. His ability to do all things came from his being in Christ. In Philippians 4 and verse 13, it says, I can do all things, most translations say, through Christ who strengthens me. But the, the Greek there, and the American Standard 1901 says, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. You see, there's something that those in Christ have that those outside of Christ do not have. And that the thing that those in Christ have is salvation. It is peace of mind. It is the glorious hope of heaven. It is a goal. It is a reward that, that is waiting for us. If we be faithful unto that time when the Lord shall call us home. And so... Our goal is not to amass the things of this world. It is to enjoy them. It is to use those things. It is to use them not only to our joy, but to the honor and glory of God. Throughout the Bible, God says, put me first. Now, I'm thought about that. It's not because God is prideful and says that, but He says that because that will give us the most blessed and contented life that we can have. Serving God is serving others, right? It's helping others. It's just seeing those opportunities to do good unto all men. As we have opportunity, Galatians 6, 10, let us do good unto all men. Why? Because that's the way our Father designed us. Then I don't think about my wants as, as much as I then realize that God supplies my needs. But here's what it is. Throughout the Bible, God asked that His people give of their first fruits. Proverbs 3.9. Listen to what it says. Honor God with 
all your substance with the first fruit of everything. Now, he didn't say honor God with some of what you had. He didn't say honor God with some of the time. But he says honor God with all your substance, everything that you possess, honor God with it, and give of the first fruits of everything. And to the Israelites, that was whether he was talking about their crops, their firstborn livestock, the firstborn of their families. But what was the first fruits? The giving of their first fruits was talking about not storing up. You know, a, a fruit tree or, uh, you know, most vegetable plants put on a first fruit. And you go out there and you pick that fruit off and then it'll put more on it. You know, you take a pepper plant, a, 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 a corn stalk will, will do that, um, you know, okra, um, tomatoes. You pull that first fruit off and then it'll put more on it. Well, under the law of Moses, what they were to do is that first fruit they pulled off, they were to take and give that to the Lord. They gave it to the priests and the Levites. That was to give it to the Lord. And that, that was the people who served the things of the Lord. But they were to give those first fruits. Now, they didn't know that that plant was going to put on anymore. Well, if I give this to the Lord, what am I going to have to eat? But they were given that. See, what it was was they were giving those first fruits to the Lord and they were acting in faith, believing that God who loved them would supply their needs and that he would put more fruit and vegetables on those plants. You see what I'm talking about? And he took those, uh, give the first of the livestock, believing that God would bless the wombs of their livestock to give them more livestock. See, it's, it's faith. It's trusting that God won't, necessarily give me what I want, but he'll supply everything that I need. And that was the giving of the first fruits out of gratitude for God sustaining them with all they needed throughout their lives. And in turn, God would continue to sustain them with all that they need. If you look there in uh, Ecclesiastes, excuse me, Proverbs chapter 3 uh, and verse 10, he says, so shall thy, this is after he says, honor with all your substance and the first fruits of all your increase, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy vat shall overflow with new wine. So it was, it was living by faith. Where have we heard that? Then the apostle Paul says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. You see, the walk by sight says, well, you know, I'm going to take half these peppers because i got to have something to eat. I'm going to take half this corn because my livestock and I've got to have something to eat. I'm going to take half of it and, and keep it. And, or, or better yet, I'm going, to, I'm going to wait and see how much corn I'm going to need and then I'll give the Lord some of what's left over. The first fruits you gave it to the Lord Trusting that he would supply your needs. So, if we're to seek God's kingdom first, then we are to do the same thing. We are to give of our first fruits in faith that God will bless us with that which we have need of. Now, there are four areas in which we need to give the Lord of our first fruits. Number one, we're to give the first fruits of our time. Roll your pants legs up because I'm going to step on some toes. What day of the week did the church assemble to worship God? Sunday. What is Sunday? The first day of the week. Well, Lord, if i got a little time left over at the end of the week, I'm going to let you have it. Lord, if, if some kind of sports doesn't come up on Sunday, I'm going to let you have that day. Well, if some, if some of my kinfolk don't come in, and I never understood that, kinfolk come in and you stay home with them. Those are the people that you're trying to have influence over to show them how much God means in your life. And yet, you don't put him first. Give him the first day of the week. It is only fitting that we should give this day to God. Do we think that 
that God's not going to allow us to do anything else the rest of the week? Is it not going to be time for all these other things? We're not, if, when we're doing that, we're not walking by faith, we're walking by sight. Number two, we are to financially give of the first fruits of what we have purposed in our hearts to give, not out of what is left over. You ask the old timers in here. That's OLE. Not OLD. How were we taught to give? Not you wait and see how much you had left over. You purposed how much you give, and that's what you gave to God first, right? And you trusted that God would, would does God know you got a 401k? Does God know that your car's gonna need a new set of tires? Does he know your children Going to college, yes. He shall seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto you. Walk by faith, then we need to give by faith. We need to give of the first fruits, not what's left over. Is that putting God first? Well, let me let me see how much I have left over. You know, I've heard this fellow, he said that he... Uh, you know, the Bible says when you give, don't let your right hand see what your left hand is doing. And so it said, it said that every Sunday he'd pull his wallet out and just reach in there. Whatever he pulled out, he'd put in the place he played. But then one of his kids said he never put anything in there bigger than a $5 bill. <laughs> so I don't know if that was given by faith there. But brother, we got to give. As we purposed in our heart. And notice here what he says, Brother, Brother Perry read. When we do, notice he says, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. You give abundantly, you shall reap abundantly. You give sparingly, you shall reap sparingly. But the, the verse that we miss so many times there in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is verse 8. And God is able, able, hear that? He's able and willing to make all grace abound unto you, that you having always all sufficiency in everything you need. If you give of your first fruits, God is going to see that you have everything, see that we have everything that we need. Give of our first fruits. Walk by faith, give by faith. Number three, we're to put the study of the Word of God first before we read that paper or magazine. Those that, that were in Berea were more noble than they in Thessalonica in that they searched the Scriptures daily. What do we put first? I told you all about the preacher came over to the lady's house and they were talking about the Bible and, and her grandson was running around there and, and the preacher and this lady was talking about the Bible and uh, they didn't have a Bible there in front of them and finally the lady says to her grandson, she says honey, she says, come on in there and get that dear old book that your grandpa loves so much the boy came back in and he had the Sears and Roe book at it <laughs> That's what he saw his mama reading. We got to put the Lord first. Number four, put God first in time for prayer. I'm guilty of this. First thing in the morning, pray to God. Well, Brother Elam, it's hard getting around with the kids in the morning and all this. Get up earlier. Pray first. Brother, when we give in this manner, in our daily lives as Christians, I'm talking about of our time and our money and, and our study and prayer, then we're putting first the kingdom of God and what is right. And this is the way that we learn contentment. It is to serve God. And whatever else in life that God sends our way, be it much or little, we will be content. Content in Christ, knowing that our home in heaven is made sure. 
is made sure by the blood of Christ that He shed for us on Calvary. That's our assurance. That's your assurance today. If you're outside of Christ, you're not in the kingdom. You've got to get in the kingdom. You've got to be in Christ. How do you want to get into Christ? You're baptized into Christ. For many of us, as we're baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Believe in Him, repent, confess His name, and be baptized. And let the Lord add you to His kingdom so that you can continue then to serve and to worship and to seek Him. And brethren, we need to understand what our needs are and not our wants. So that we'll not be anxious over these other things. We need to, to live in faith where we have it. Let us repent. Ask God to forgive us and then walk, give, pray in faith. The invitation is extended this morning. If there's any that are in need of the prayers of the church here, come and let that be known. Any here that are ready to obey the gospel, to put him on in baptism, to have your sins washed away, this is the time. We encourage you to come while we stand and we say. If we walk with the Lord.